Will Utah football have a top 15 offense in 2023 and beyond? We're talking about it on today's Locked on Utes. You are Locked on Utes, your daily podcast on the Utah Utes. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and thank you for making Locked On Utes your first listen every single day. We are available on all platforms, including YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on college. And when you enter promo code locked on college, all caps, no spaces, they'll throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. My name is J2 Isto, former intern inside the University of Utah Athletic Department. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about the present and future of Utah's offense. And in order to help us do that, it's ESPN 700's Porter Larson. And, and Porter, we're talking about this because Adam Rittenberg of ESPN released his rankings. He did this for the defensive side of the ball, too. Utah came in, I believe, at eight with that for their present and future defenses, especially. So they Utah comes in at 15th in terms of their present and kind of future offense for where Adam Rittenberg ranks it amongst college football's other offenses. As for especially in 2023, I do feel like this offensive unit belongs in the top 15. And I really don't have an issue with their placement at 15th either. Just looking at some of the teams there in front of, we can dive in on that later. But when you look at the continuity, you got eight starters returning from last season. And that's not even including Brant Keithy, who's probably like, it's going to be one of the greatest like transitions we've ever seen from a tight end, just going back from Dalton to Brant, just like it was Brant the year before to Dalton, basically. So that'll be great. Andy Ludwig, of course, being back, you know, last season, this team, it was like, well, they could use a little bit more explosive playmakers. Money parks is back after breaking out late all the transfer receivers in and that's without even mentioning uh jaquindon jackson who i think is just going to be an absolute monster this season so i definitely think this offense belongs in the top 15 yeah the the returning starters jt the overall balance of the offense right it's it's not heavily reliant on one specific part too much yes cam rising is is the the motor that that turns everything but it's it's just a well balanced well oiled machine and that's how andy ludwig likes it right and top 15, it sounds really good when you're a Utah football team because you're used to relying on your defense a little bit more, yeah. leaning on that that elite defense. That's not even like a lofty expectation. They were number 11 last year, mm-hmm. number 14 the year before when you're, when you're talking about, about averages, right? So this is a top 15 offense already, and they're returning all of this, uh, all of this production few question marks, right? You, you, mm-hmm. you got to fill out some some question marks on the outside. Uh, and it's more about which guys uh, start to distance themselves. I, I think they have the bodies. They've got a, a mm-hmm. lot of good options there. You mentioned Brandt. Not a usual tight end, right? They're going to see him out mm-hmm. wide. You're going to see him on jet sweeps. You're going to see him yep. involved in the offense in all the different ways. Uh, but outside of that, it's you know a, a couple of starters along the offensive line. And then you're groovy. <laughs> you know, you've got Cam. Uh, obviously, the question mark of of his availability week one early in the year is is still a topic of conversation. Cam's going to be ready. A- outside of re-injury, outside of a, a obstacle coming up in his rehab process, uh, I, I wouldn't worry about that. Cam will be ready not only uh, for, for week one, but I think you'll you'll get to see at least glimpses of him during fall camp as well. Which is a really welcome sign for Utah fans. I know it's what you spoke about last time you were on here too. And Porter, I don't know about you, but I can already just imagine how loud that stadium is going to be if Bad Moon Rising starts to play that first snap against Florida. It is going to be electric as always. And one thing I thought was really interesting that uh, Rittenberg mentioned, and I've seen a lot of people mention too for this Utah offense, is just how big it is that Andy Ludwig is staying. You know, having that continuity in place, doing the same thing. No matter who you would have promoted, probably would have done things slightly differently. So just having Cam and Coach Ludwig, who are of course on the same page going on two years starting now together basically we already right. mentioned all the returning um your top two pass catchers in terms of receivers are going to be back and then we had you had Bran out there as well so it really feels like his return being cam risings to and to go along with andy ludwig who for a time it looked like he might have been headed for notre dame is just another reason this offense is going to be so strong is because of that continuity yeah i mean continuity is huge especially with an offense right when you have to bring in new players it's not just putting them into the fold, right? It's especially with Andy. Andy's really good at, 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 you know, 
building a system around the personnel he has and, and, and kind of uh, fine tuning it to the strengths of the players on his roster. So when there's not a whole bunch of turnover over the course of a year, you don't have to install a bunch of new stuff. You don't have to uh, go over a, a bunch of new offenses with new players, new sets, new formations and, and audibles. That's something that Cam, the offensive line, uh, the receiver crew and, and, and the backfield pretty much all has history and reps together doing. So what that means is that the second that Cam, Re- Cam Rising is ready, uh, the second that he's he's good to do some reps, and frankly, that's probably pretty soon as far as is just walk through running through uh, plays in the playbook. You can get into prep for Florida. Mm-hmm. You don't have to do much install when everyone on this offense is is uh, not playing catch up. Right? There's a few guys. There's going to be a, a couple new starters in the offensive line. There's a few transfers coming in, especially as we talk about uh, on the outside. Mm-hmm. Whether it's, it's it's Micah Pittman. Um, there, there's going to be a, a couple of guys that have an acclimation process, but for the most part, JT, you're you're lining up and 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 putting putting forth the the same unit you did last year, and that was a strong one, as we mentioned, one of the the top fifteen offenses in the country. No reason they uh, they shouldn't replicate that in twenty twenty three. I totally agree. I think the only th- reason that they wouldn't be a top 15 offense to me is, well, number one, I guess we talked about the cam. There's so if injuries or something like that were to happen, that would knock them off. Um, the only other thing I could think of, though, is if something happened up front, right? Like I feel good about Falcon Calmatule at left tackle is if you're talking about like overall, what is your biggest question? It, it is probably how is he going to perform overall? Just because look, Brad Daniels was unbelievable. I mean, the last couple of seasons, it's not easy to replace him. And then you look at what Bam Olaseni did stepping in on that left side too. So that's a little bit of a spot i want to see michael mokafisi kind of continue to grow um on yesterday's show with michelle bodkin um i talked about this one list actually projected that mokafisi would be a third team all pack 12 guard which i think it shows kind of some of the belief that people have in him being able to grow in that spot too. johnny maia getting the start in there too could be see some jaron Kump along there as well there's a lot of factors still determined up front but still having three starters back overall and two of those being keaton bills and satawa laumea who have been mainstays on this huge offensive line for the past two seasons when they've won the Pac-12 championship, I think is huge and why I don't feel like super concerned about the offense. And I feel like they will come together and help this group be a top 15 offense overall. Yeah, I think similarly to, and this is not unique to Utah or Jim Harding, offenses and especially offensive lines take time throughout the season. Continuity for an offensive line is very much a different thing than than just a, a an offensive unit as a as a whole, right? When you watch football, a lot of times we're ball watching. We're watching mm-hmm. the quarterback, the running back. You don't necessarily realize how much goes on in the first one second of a football yeah. play. The steps that the offensive linemen have to take, the uh, the as you mentioned, the continuity, right? The communication that each one of those guys has to have every single play pre-snap and right at the beginning of the snap is not easy. It's it's genuinely a a complicated process and and the the biggest uh, complication in in football. Um, So it takes some time to to get that going. So I I think similarly to how we we see these teams evolve over the course of the year, you're going to see some hiccups early on, especially – especially against an SEC squad like Florida who has, uh, and this isn't a typo, a 360-pound defensive tackle who plays rep after rep after rep. Like there's going to be some growing pains early, but just as as we talk about every single year, you're going to see tweets about firing Jim Harding week one, (laughs) two, three, and then you're going to see tweets week 11, 12, 13 about hiring Jim Harding on an NFL team. It's the thing we hear every single year. We'll, we'll hear it again this year. And I think that offensive line, barring injuries, um, they're comfortable with eight, nine guys that they feel like can give them Pac-12 reps. So finding that five, finding which five specifically you're going to run with, it'll be a process early, but uh, I don't really have too many worries about that. And you mentioned the returners. Keaton Bills, Satawa Lomea, those are two guys that I, I'm looking at as not only all-conference players, but uh, potentially – bigger than that right they're they're future pros at this rate 
Yeah, I mean, Bills was projected a first team, all uh, not first team, excuse me, but like a third team All American. And I believe it was Phil Steele's college football preview. So that's just kind of huge stuff. And those guys are capable of doing that. And definitely NFL futures for both those guys, too. Totally go, agree with you on it. Yeah. Go watch, the- sorry, go watch Keaton the last four weeks of the season. Great point. He, he's been good his entire mm-hmm. time here, especially when he's able to to continue get reps healthy, right? Go watch the last month of the season and just zero in on Keaton Bills and Braden Daniels too. But man, those two are wrecking balls late in the year. Absolutely. And like you said, even if they don't get off to the hottest start this year, don't overreact because it takes that time a little bit and they'll be rolling when it matters. So I absolutely agree with you on the offense of line and just the offense in general. We're going to continue to talk about this Utah offense, but look ahead to the 2023 or excuse me, look ahead to the 2024 and 2025 seasons in a moment. But first we got to tell you a little bit more about our friends at bird dogs. Bird Dog stretchy khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. Bird Dog shorts do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but they fit way better. They fit way better than regular shorts because those kind of shorts are made with a stiff, restricting cotton. Bird Dogs fix this issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movements. Bird Dogs use anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. Guys, I use my Bird Dogs all the time whether i'm recording this podcast taking my dog for a walk hanging out with friends just going to watch a movie bird dogs are my number one short choice and now you guys can get in on the bird dogs action as well because you can go to birddogs.com slash locked on college for a free yeti style tumbler with your order that's birddogs.com slash locked on college for a free yeti style tumbler you won't want to take your bird dogs off we promise you so once again go to birddogs.com slash locked on college for a free yeti style tumbler with your order All righty, Porter, coming back into this one. Let's talk about the future of Utah's offense now, which, of course, has been really exciting to talk about based on these recruiting classes that Utah's been able to bring in, not just how great the 23 recruiting classes, but what a great start the 24 one is off to after landing Isaac Wilson a few weeks ago. So when you're talking about the future of Utah's offense, in Rittenberg's article, he has them listed as the the future quarterback power rankings. He has them at 19 right now. I definitely think they could climb up that ranking once a couple of these guys see the field. I think it's just hard because we've only seen Cam Rising and Bryson Barnes as of recently. And then just the future offense power rankings. He has them at 23 overall. And I can understand why that is, but I think when these guys see the field, I definitely think this is one that's going to climb. Now, starting off with the quarterback spot, as we mentioned, you have three guys in Brandon Rose, Isaac Wilson, and then Nate Johnson as well, who I all think can be quality quarterbacks at this level. And I, I, especially Wilson, I'll say, and I think Johnson has an incredibly high ceiling too, but just some of the stuff I've been able to see Wilson do in person, I think he can truly be a special player. When you're looking at some of the playmakers you pair them with, Mikey Matthews with so many veterans, I'm not sure what his role will look like this season, although he surprised a lot of people in spring camp, so it'll be interesting to see. He's going to be a guy who's going to make a lot of plays. Look at a Jalen Glover too, a guy who's had to kind of wait these last two seasons and or last season and then this year as well, just because Jaquindon and Makai are still here. I think he's going to break out too. Then you get the Caleb Lomus and the Spencer Fanos of the world on the offensive line. And that's not even mentioning the bevy of tight ends. This Utah offense has kind of in the wings waiting for both Yasmin and Keithy to move on. So I definitely feel like this Utah offense is in a really good place for the future Porter. Yeah. And I like that you mentioned the, the guys up front, Lomu, mm-hmm. Fano, um, that's, that's where it starts. We just talked about it on that, that last segment, right? So landing those big-time recruits in-state, but also a, a, across the Pac-12 footprint mm-hmm. up front is, is huge. Because I think Utah, a lot of times, right, they get these unheralded guys. Uh, mm-hmm. that, that come in, not all that well-known. And, you know, they have that, that, that Polynesian pipeline, of course. And then yep. they turn into NFL players. Jim Harding has a track record of doing that. So – now getting these top flight recruits, getting some of these uh, more heralded uh, recruits is, is huge. I think he's going to turn those guys into genuine, genuine uh, top flight Pac-12 players. Uh, and, and like we said, it starts up front. I, I struggle projecting, especially this day and age in college football, right? When we look forward to 2024, 2025, What is the roster going to look like, right? And Utah specifically is really good at at trying to recruit the guys in the room, and and they've done a good job of not having too much attrition through the transfer portal. So I do think that it's it's you know going to continue that, and they'll have that continuity. But there's also that that uncertainty, right? In this era of college football, 
just look at the Utes running back position over the course of the last four years. Now, there are some variables there where, of course, yep. the, the tragedy of Ty Jordan, stuff like that, where it's been a little too crazy, right? Yes. But, but just look at how much uh, roster changes year in, year out in college football. That's that's not really going to slow down in, in this new era. So that's the other thing. We kind of have to completely reset and, and recalibrate every offseason, see who's going to be in the backfield, see what kind of protection they have, what kind of weapons they have, who's transferring, who's transferring in. That being said, the success that the Utes have had over the last two or three years – not only getting to the Rose Bowl, not only getting over the Pac-12 title hump, but getting guys like Dalton Kincaid into the NFL, getting guys like Tyler Huntley, getting eyes on guys like Cam Rising. They're now getting recruits who see that success, not just as Utah is this you know, uh, little school that could anymore, but a place where you can go as a top flight recruit and continue that trend into the next level to being a professional football player. Those recruits are starting to see that this is a, a possibility in Salt Lake. So mm -hmm. you're getting transfers like Dallin Bentley from Snow College, who just yep. saw what De Dalton Kincaid did, right? Um, that's huge. And, and for that reason, instead of finding a bunch of diamonds in the rough that Utah's lived off of doing for 20 years, they're now finding diamonds like not really in the rough. They're, yeah. they're <laughs> right out in, in the open, right? And, and that's going to help you uh year in and year out continue to keep that level right we're talking about this offense being 11th in the country in scoring last year 15th the year before i think 27th or something the year before that as long as there's no obstacles no roadblocks no coaching changes yeah you can continue that continuity and there's there's no reason to to really believe there should be any sort of sharp uh decline that's a great point, though, on also just the changes and how everything can go. Yes, you feel good about everything that's there, but why has Utah consistently been able to beat these teams that were finding what appear to be those diamonds, right? It's because they recruited the right guys. They found the Brant Keithys, the Devin Lloyds of the world. They took chances on those guys who had the right work ethic, and then they end up booming better than a lot of those other high recruits did. So that's where you got to feel good about where Utah's at, but you make a really good point. It's important not to overreact because especially with college football, I mean, I was looking at even some of last year's recruits, and it's like, oh yeah, they're already gone. Like, this is just the world of college football that we live in. There's lots of change and turnover overall. So it's always crazy to see how things change. And as I mentioned for Utah, they're 15th in the power rankings overall. Porter, I know you got the list pulled up that Adam Rittenberg had as well. When I look at the 15 teams in front of them that are projected to be better than them this year and kind of relating towards the future as well, I, I really got no issues with any of them. There's not one I'm like, man, Utah should definitely be better than. If you're telling me that Utah is better than like, UCLA maybe, or like maybe they are better than Oregon. Like I'm not falling out of my chair backwards, but I, I really don't have an issue with Utah's placement in this list at all. Yeah. I, I mean, they, I, I think have solidified their place as you want to win the PAC 12. You want to be in the PAC 12 title game. You come yep. through Salt Lake and mm -hmm. frankly, until Kyle Whittingham hangs it up mm -hmm. and depending on what happens when that time comes, there's no no reason to believe that they can't continue that pace, right? Uh, we look at their four-year recruiting average. Uh, I'm going to shout out my guy Dave Bartu, the College Football Matrix. He provides me with a bunch of data that he also provides to coaches and, and coaching staffs around the country that show your trend, right? And I think this is kind of what Adam Rittenberg is is, mm -hmm. is leaning on is, is that kind of data where it's it's not the players you have in the locker room right now. It's the trends that you have in recruiting. It's the trends you have in, in the, the rosters that you're building. Right. And prognosticating forward, you don't know which guys specifically are going to be there, but you know what type of athletes are going to be yes. there. You know what uh, kind of gauge, what kind of recruits are going to be there in two, three, four years. And yeah, I mean, Utah has a solid footprint in the, the Pac-12 and beyond, right? And they, they started to make inroads in the South. They started to make inroads in Houston and Texas and in Morgan Scally has been huge there. Yes. So the recruiting, recruiting, I don't think is, is going to slow down. And for that reason, there's no reason to, to believe that the, the, the youths are going to have any sort of big drop off. And the other thing is access to the college football playoff is about to change. Um, 
the the bowl structure is about to change. And I think, frankly, with the direction the Pac-12 is going, that only helps Utah. And mm-hmm. right now, top 15 is, is as you mentioned in, in Rittenberg's rankings, that's not a ranking. That's just a reality of yep. where Utah football is. They're a top 15, top 20 yes. college football program in the country. I don't think that's a ranking. That's just a, a reality. It really is when you base it on the recent success and everything that they've achieved and it's happened. And it is cool just to see Utah amongst some of these names where you have the Florida States um, who started to come make a comeback kind of themselves. Um, but the LSU to be close to Penn State, Oregon, all those things like the traditional ones that like forever have been kind of top 15, top 20 programs versus Utah, who's kind of steadily worked their way up there. I think it's really cool. And Porter, one of the biggest reasons that Utah has put themselves in this position to be a top 15, top 20 program, especially the last few years, has of course been and cam rising and as cams continued to make plays on the field a lot of people have made notice of that including jim Nagy, who tweeted out who's the director of the senior bowl or just the head of the senior bowl who tweeted out some very glowing stuff about cam rising i'll read it right now so what Nagy said was um our utah football followers know how much senior bowl buys into utah qb's cam rising's grittiness that made clear in the post over the past two years and they know nfl scouts appreciate what cam is made of too he also says when we pulled nfl teams last fall most had a mid to late day three grade on rising so odds are he would have been selected if he entered the 23 draft after back-to-back rose bowl appearances nfl evaluators gave gamer type backups who are resourceful enough to make things happen off script amid calf and cam rising has proven he can be that guy and just looking a little bit down there's a little more there if you guys want to check out the full tweet you guys can head over to jim Nagy's twitter account he has on there checked gamer moxie toughness sneaky athlete uh, multiple pitches. And I think the thing I love is I just love the word, the usage of the word gritty, right? Like, cause that's just what Cam was. He finds a way to get it done. But uh, Porter and me reading all that, what's the biggest thing that stands out to you? The the funniest thing that stands out is that he snuck the sneaky athlete in there. The, yeah. The white guy, the white yeah. guy who's a sneaky <laughs> athlete. Listen, I, I get it. Cause like Cam wears the flak jacket. He's, he's kind of looks a little chubby. They call yep. him thick boy. Seven, I'm, yeah. not, I'm, not, I'm not calling the starting quarterback quarterback thick boy, by the way. Uh, that'll be the last time you hear me do it. But listen, he's a gamer. Like you hear those words, you hear gritty, sneaky athlete. It kind of sounds cliche when you're talking about an undersized quarterback from Utah, but it's exactly what Cam Rising is. You see that play against USC that's probably going to be, you know, that picture of Cam without the helmet, that's going to yeah. be hanging up in the Utah football facility at some point. He plays through injury. He plays mm-hmm. through uh, just time after time. He shows his toughness. He shows his durability. But in the same token, that's also why he's not seen as like a top, top flight draft prospect because yep. Cam hasn't been able to get through a season without getting injured, without having mm-hmm. to, you know, see Bryson Barnes. And that's not a knock on Cam. That's just NFL guys realizing that, listen, this is a gamer. This is a player who will come in when we need him to give us reps. He's going to have command of the offense. He can make the throws. He can he can give you reps. But does he have that ceiling that other guys have? You're right. Cam's not 6'5", 240 pounds like Josh Allen. He can run. He can he can get after it. He can scramble. But can he stay healthy? Can he uh, can he be a, a, a down in? down out quarterback in the national football league. I think right now he's seen as more of a utility type backup. Mm -hmm. Um, Tyler Huntley comes to mind, right? He's a guy who went into a specific system in Baltimore and fits it really well. There's going to be teams that look at cam rising and think, Oh, he has a lot of traits that our quarterback has. Let's get him in our locker room in case he goes down, right? In case our first guy goes down, not a guy that's going to project as a, a starter week one, and I think that's probably a good thing for Cam long term as far as his NFL uh, prospects go. But, yeah, he had NFL scouts eyes last year. They gave him feedback that it wasn't bad. It was just, you know, I can come back. I can make six figures playing football at the University of Utah. Uh, why not come back and, and yeah. finish something that, that, I, that I started? Cam's a, a California kid, right? Looking at that Rose Bowl, that's something he wants as, as much as yeah. uh, Kyle Whittingham, also a California kid. They they grew up in the the, the shadows of the Rose Bowl. Uh, so they look at that, and, and they want to get back there. They want to win one. 
maybe it's a different bowl game, but but I think that that's something that's on the the back of their minds now that the Pac-12 is uh, in the rear view. You've got the Pac-12 titles. There's loftier goals now, and, and I think that Cam, you know, saw opportunity, yes, to make money, but also to come back and and kind of solidify his place in in Ute's history and still have a shot at the next level when it's uh, when it's all said and done. He absolutely will, and it's because of the reviews you see from a guy like Jim Nagy who really knows the game of football, and as he said, he's not the only one who shares his admiration for Cam Rising when you get to kind of that scouting level. So it's going to be interesting to see the kind of season Cam has because it can be a special one. And Porter, we're still a little over two months away from Utah football getting started, but what's what are you guys talking about over on ESPN 700 right now? Yeah, man, summertime is when it gets a little lean. We just had the NBA Finals wrap up, so it's, it's getting to that time where we got baseball, we got soccer, we got some golf, uh, but now we're within 80 days, actually, of Utah football. So we're going to get heavy into to Camp Kyle. We're going to get heavy into, you know, looking at Florida, Baylor, some of the, the early opponents for Utah, and, and start to turn our coverage to what we know that listeners uh, on this station kind of tune in for, 365 days a year, which is, uh, of course, Utah football. So that's that's kind of the direction we'll go. Of course, we got the NBA draft coming up, so – the Jazz are, are of note, uh, if you will, in that regard. But, uh, yeah, kind of all over the place, as we always are. But the the attention is starting to turn to to Utah football, and, and I'm sure that'll that'll please a lot of listeners of this podcast. It absolutely will, just like we're always lucky to get you on here. Porter, thank you for joining us. Thanks, JT. Sneaky athlete, this guy is. Hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the word, the phrase of the day. There you go. Uh, appreciate Porter as always for coming on with us. That is going to do it for today's Locked On Utes. Make sure you guys come back tomorrow as me and Jake Hatch will be talking all things conference realignment. We'll see you then on Locked On Utes.